So welcome everyone. Hello, Max. Uh, my name is Aris Komporosos Afanasiu, and uh, well, and today we'll be launching our uh, new podcast, The Order of Unmanageable Risks. So, so this is a brand new podcast that uh, Max and I have been working on over the last few weeks. Uh, it's a podcast about anxiety and capitalism. So um, the podcast itself is an eclectic uh, series about the crisis of anxiety in our society today, and it's links to, it's links to capitalism. The podcast is produced by the Common Anxieties Research Project with the support of UCL's Institute for, for Advanced Studies and the Reimagining Value Action Lab. For more information, you can visit our website at uh, anxious.community. So let me give you a bit of background to the podcast. As academics, uh, Max and I, as academics who are interested in the workings of our financialized capitalism, we have found ourselves circling more and more often around the question of anxiety. So I'm talking here about the anxiety of our students, of our friends, of our colleagues, but our own anxiety as well. So we're over a decade, 12 years now, since the 2008 financial crisis and the sweeping ways of the neoliberal austerity and uh, kind of uh, uh, regressive politics that succeeded that crisis. And it looks like today there is a generalized sense of collective anxiety that has taken root in our, uh, in our societies. So a kind of anxiety that becomes deeply, deeply embedded in the very structures of capitalism. So what we mean by that is not that we just become more anxious about the uncertainties that are now engulfing our everyday life, all aspects of our everyday life, from economic volatility, labor precarity, uh, employment uh, uh, uncertainties, the regressive political instabilities and volatilities that we're faced with, let alone, the, not to mention the chaos, the total chaos uh, that has been uh, brought by, um, brought into sharp focus by the COVID-19 epidemic. So while all this is happening, while all these uncertainties and anxieties are taking root, the ways that we're engaging with this world, with this chaotic world, seems to be shifting as well. And this is a shift that our podcast is very interested in exploring. We no longer seem willing to believe in the promises that capitalism and the dominant form of capitalism, neo, what we've called neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism, uh, had, uh, had always made to us, the promises of a better future. So these promises had been of full employment, of, of, uh, of a certain uh, of a certain fulfillment, work and life and personal life fulfillment. These are promises that are, until recently have been the hallmark of neoliberal capitalism. So we're left in, in, a, in a climate, in an atmosphere, whereby we would like, we're very interested in making sense of what the new politics, the emerging politics of this world is. How, what is this politics of the, the, this kind of climate of collective anxiety that we're experiencing? If, we, if we've stopped now believing in that uh, a better world is possible through the, through, this, uh, through the promises of capitalism. Uh, so in our past work, Max and I have explored many aspects of capitalism and its workings, the way, specifically the way in which capitalism shapes our dominant imaginations of the future. That is how, what we are able to do and what not in the future, what alternatives there are in the future. The famous there is no alternative is a, is a crisis of our imagination caused by uh, capitalism. So we've looked at various aspects of this, of this issue, of this core problem, um, among which the way in which finance in particular seems to be very particularly well placed to, uh, to, to survive and make profit from the uncertainties uh, that we're experiencing today, to speculate and uh, use uncertainty as a lucrative resource. So uh, in this process, our, in our research journeys and in our previous projects, we have uh, always returned to the role of imagination. So, the, and we've looked at the successes and failures of, uh, of, ca of, capitalist, of the capitalist project, which ultimately rely on its ability to control and to wield the power to imagine. So this is then the perspective from which we approach 
the anxiety epidemic, the so-called anxiety epidemic uh, that is at the heart of this podcast. So some of the questions we're trying to ask are what kind of collectivity is imagined today in our anxious engagements with the chaos of everyday life? What are the possibilities for a more radical imagination that, that would lean on our shared experiences of anxiety in order to counter speculate, to speculate against the speculations of financial capital? In the order of unmanageable risks, we try to address these questions and we do that through interviews with important thinkers whose work has inspired us to think differently about both capitalism and society. And so I'll pass it on to Max now, who'll tell us a little bit more about the themes that we have covered and we're going to cover in this podcast. Thanks so much, Aris, and uh, good, to, good to be with you all. Thanks for joining us for this launch event. Um, so I wanted to maybe uh, just tell a little bit of a story about how this podcast came about. And, and as Aris has mentioned, our curiosity has been drawn towards um, the, the epidemic, so-called epidemic of student anxiety. And I'll explain in a minute why I say so-called and why we put the term epidemic in quotation marks. But let me first say that I think what, what drew us to this project was a conversation Aris and I started having where we began with the question, well, okay, we and our colleagues for the last few years have been working to understand the effects of financialization on our subjectivity, on how we understand ourselves, on how we have agency in the world. And the argument that we and others have made is that financialization, this force where everything in the world becomes subject to the pressures of the financial sector, um, Financialization isn't just a sort of a grim dystopian imposition, although of course it has horrific effects on people's lives all around the world. Rather, financialization really depends on harnessing and activating and, um, and uh, in a certain way enlivening our imaginations. We all become these kind of miniature financiers where we treat everything from our personal relationships to university education to uh, housing as a financial asset. And we all become a kind of a freewheeling investor self in the world. Uh, so we and a number of other really brilliant uh, theorists around the world have been, have been identifying this over the last couple of decades. And our question to ourselves was, well, what comes next? I mean, we could, we could write another paper showing how uh, finance activates and depends on our imagination, but what is gonna come after? this subject, especially in a moment of prolonged inexorable financial crisis as we've been in since the 2008 financial crisis, ultimately on some level, and now especially in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we thought, well, what about thinking about the, the subjectivity, the mental environment, the dispositions of a generation who's never known anything except financial crisis, who is never raised with necessarily the optimism around the kind of great neoliberal dream that, for instance, we were raised under. And so we began to say, well, these people are actually our students in the university. They're people who are between the ages of 19 and 25 now, who their entire really adult life and much of their child life has been lived in a moment of prolonged financial crisis and disenchantment. And so we said, well, what is, what is the thing that we would then look to in these young people? And we said, aha, one of the things that really defines this generation of university students is this so-called epidemic of anxiety. How can we understand the epidemic of anxiety as linked to financialization? And how can we do it so that we don't just contribute to the bemoaning of the fate of this generation, a way that we can actually try and see what powers and what knowledges and what genius might emerge from this generation uh, as financialized, truly financialized subjects. Do they have some sort of powers or some sort of knowledges that we who have come from an earlier generation don't have? And so we thought, well, let, let's, uh, let's do a bunch of workshops with our students. And we began in, uh, in, in earlier in 2019, or at the end of 2019, to plan these really intensive workshops that we were going to do through March and April in London at London-based universities with university students in, in their undergrad to really try and think through together uh, and theorize together the connections between financialization and anxiety. And... Uh, we wanted to do that then uh, 
the university faculty in England went on strike, and of course we were on strike and supportive of the strike, so we had to cancel the in-person workshops. We moved to an online workshop format, and just as we were about to launch it, the pandemic happened. And it felt to us that it would be wrong to ask students to focus on student anxiety in a moment when a lot of other forms of anxiety were rushing into the scene. The anxiety of not knowing where you're going to live, where you're going to work, what's going to happen to your studies, if you're going to have to go and live with your family, all the sorts of anxieties that people had. The anxieties that formed as the pandemic progressed, including, you know, the incredible differential rates of mortality and suffering that were faced by uh, racialized people, for instance or the ways in which it has unleashed a great uncertainty about the future. So it felt like talking about the epidemic of student anxiety in this moment of the pandemic was the wrong thing to do. And we thought, well, what can we do with the research we've already done and keep the dialogue going? And that is where the podcast comes from. Ultimately, we said, let's reach out to a bunch of colleagues in a variety of different fields uh, that we've been, whose work we've been reading, who we think have something interesting to say about this epidemic of anxiety. Uh, and let's see what they have to say. Now, when we think about the epidemic of anxiety, we are moving far away from the very limited medical model that most people would approach this topic from. We are, of course, interested in the suffering of individuals, but we are asking another kind of question, which is, if we zoom out far enough and we ask about this epidemic of anxiety from a sociological perspective, what does that tell us? Why is there an epidemic of student anxiety now? What is it about a historical moment that gives rise to these symptoms that we identify as anxiety on such a mass scale? Um, is there something that we're not seeing when we accept one of three common explanations for this epidemic? And is there something about this word epidemic which recently under the COVID-19 pandemic has taken on a whole new meaning. Is there something about this word epidemic that actually maybe mystifies more than it explains? Who is served by describing this as an epidemic? And I've just, uh, I'll go through the three sort of bad explanations for the epidemic that we sort of take aim at. Um, the first is that, uh, it, and, and this tends to come from more conservative, right-wing, reactionary places, but it can also come from progressive and uh, left-wing places too, is the theory of a coddled generation. So this is most, um, most famously articulated in a, in a book, in an article from The Atlantic called The Coddling of the American Mind, where the authors argue ultimately that the reason why young people are so anxious today is because they've been poorly prepared for life in the real world. Uh, that parents and teachers have been too permissive uh, and too accommodating and too worried about young people's mental health uh, and their capacity to endure and to deal with conflict. And as a result, we have a generation of so-called snowflakes who can't deal with conflict and can't deal with the anxieties that are just a normal part of living a life. Um, this explanation is essentially a form of victim blaming, and we think it really doesn't explain very much about our current moment. And as has been brought up by a number of young people writing in the current uprisings in the United States, we're seeing the same generation that was once accused of being snowflakes taking incredible risks in the name of upholding and demanding racial justice in this moment, confronting police, confronting the military, uh, really coming into their own in a generation of struggle. So clearly this coddled generation thesis does not serve to actually explain the crisis. It largely serves the narcissism of older generations. Okay, the second, um, the second explanation that we sort of challenge is the idea that this anxiety epidemic is simply a matter of um, technological addiction. That essentially young people were raised on smartphones, they were raised on Instagram, on Snapchat, on Facebook, and this has made them essentially uh, sort of addled their brains. Uh, and there's a number of very convincing and quite interesting arguments for this that, that uh, range in their level of sophistication. But ultimately, this then also mystifies a lot. I mean, maybe there's some element of truth to uh, the idea that a generation raised on these technologies is gonna have difficulty adapting to the world. Uh, but we need to take a lot more of a nuanced look at it and also take a look that doesn't fetishize or demonize technology. These technologies, have many different uses. Many young people are using these technologies, in fact, to help themselves find peer groups and support to overcome mental uh, illness and mental health challenges. Um, and further, 
we can't just treat these technologies like they're a natural occurrence. Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, these are all designed by huge corporations who are studying neuroscience, who are studying the science of gambling in order to basically create addictive um, uh, technologies. So when we talk about the, the role of technology, we need to name the names and understand the power relations if we're going to actually understand what's going on. The third uh, bad explanation we have for the anxiety crisis is, uh, and is in fact the most dominant, is that it's simply a biomedical matter and that it shouldn't be discussed sociologically, that it's just something to be dealt with between individuals and various healthcare practitioners, whether they're psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, or counselors at universities. This is a really unfortunate approach um, because it mystifies, again, the fact that if so many people in this moment are anxious and in the same uh, institution, which is to say the university, then it behooves us to look at the structural and systemic factors as well as the individual ones. The problem with the individualized biomedical model is that it's focused on the pathologization of the individual. That if you're suffering from anxiety, it's because there's something wrong with you, you need to learn to be more adaptive, you need to lead, learn to be more resilient, or you need to be prescribed psychopharmaceuticals to assist you. Now, many people gain really important uh, 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 solace and, and uh, stabilization through psychopharmaceuticals. So we're not critiquing that necessarily, although of course we wanna pay attention to the psychopharmaceutical industry and its annexes in research and development and the sort of corporate mainframe around it. However, um, we also do want to say on some level that this model uh, is, not, is not good enough, even when it's articulated with the highest degree of sympathy for young people, for students and others. So neither the caudal generation argument, nor the technological argument, nor the biomedical argument serves us well enough to really um, give us the answers to this moment. And the final thing I would say is that what we wanted to do in this project and in this podcast is not simply theorize the experience of young people and students for them. We actually want to create venues and resources by which young people can theorize for themselves their own experience. So with that, maybe what we'll do is turn briefly to the actual uh, podcast itself and the episodes that we've already um, that we've already uh, produced and that we are going to produce and go through them quite briefly. Uh, let me just see if we can bring it up here. So, here great. So, we've, so as you can see in our website, anxious.community, we already have made available the five first episodes and we will just quickly uh, run you through those first uh, five episodes. So we opened this series with a, a conversation with artist and writer James Bridle. Uh, and so in that first episode, we, uh, we discussed James's uh, recent work uh, in his book, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the New Dark Age. And so it was a, a, we thought it was a great way to open the, the series because it really, the book and James really uh, delves deep into the politics, the hidden politics of uh, our current capitalist uncertainty. So a lot of uh, our, that first discussion sort of sets the scene for, for what was to follow, which was this kind of dynamic of what is articulated, uh, discernible, legible, uh, in, in the way we relate to capitalism and to technologies in particular, and what remains always hidden, what remains invisible, what is too complex uh, to, to be understood by us as users of technologies. So uh, James' work puts the question of power at the center of that analysis, uh, the power of being visible or invisible. So um, this sort of set, set the tone for, for the next uh, few episodes. That we, um, that we produced. Yeah, in episode two, we speak with Birkbeck professor Esther Leslie, uh, whose work I became familiar with initially through her incredibly insightful readings of um, the, the uh, mid 20th century theorist Walter Benjamin. Um, 
in this episode, we looked at an article by Esther on emojis and the way that the emoji represents uh, a new horizon by which capitalism puts our emotions to work and reduces our emotions to a kind of rudimentary uh, metric. You can think about, you know, you've probably seen in airports, but also in workplaces, these strange emoji laden Likert scale button uh, arrays where, you know, if you approve of how uh, how well the bathroom has been cleaned or how well your service has been performed, you get to give feedback through these kind of smiley and frowny faces. Um, and these are just the tip of an iceberg of a whole range of technologies that uh, Esther goes through in her article and in our interview that uh, demonstrate that the the emotive and affective body has always been a target of capitalist accumulation and that this has a lot to do with the ways in which uh, we experience anxiety and other um, and other experiences that today are categorized as mental illness. In our third episode uh, we speak with uh, Australia-based um, critical race theorist Alana Lenton about the ways in which talk about racism makes so many people anxious, specifically so many people who would be considered white or who consider themselves white. Um, and we speak about a chapter in Alana's new book, Why Race Still Matters, about how there has been a move over the last 10 or 15 years by especially reactionary, but not exclusively reactionary voices uh, in the political spectrum to violently and vigorously insist that their racist speech and action is quote unquote, not racist. Um, and so Alana really walks us through how this is connected to the construction of race historically in the um, development of capitalism and how it functions today in order to produce a certain set of anxieties which on a, in, a, in a very real way are manifesting themselves across the political field in the form of sort of right wing revanchist reactionary um, uh, racism in uh, a whole variety of different areas, something that of course has become uh, all the more urgent in the last few weeks since we recorded the interview. In our fourth episode, we speak with um, consultant and practitioner, healthcare practitioner, uh, health and social care practitioner, I should say, Harry Sewell, uh, who in the UK has been one of the leading voices in developing a way of thinking through and talking about the impacts of uh, race and racism on mental health. And Harry, in this interview, goes through a really wide variety of uh, examples of the way that uh, not only the experience of racism produces ill mental health in racialized people, but also, I think really importantly, the way that we then blame racialized people for their own poor mental health, as if this has nothing to do with living in a society suffused with racism. And there's a kind of, uh, he doesn't use this terminology, but to use the, the kind of contemporary terminology, there's a kind of gaslighting going on where, uh, you know, racialized people are told that they suffer from higher rates of mental illness, uh, and this is sort of accepted by the health practitioner and social care community. And yet what gets invisibilized are all of the systemic and structural factors that impinge upon the lives of racialized people. Uh, so a very interesting uh, interview about anxiety and racism uh, from Harry Sewell. And so in our fifth episode, we spoke with one of the most renowned uh, anthropologist so far of our time, uh, Professor Arjun Apadure uh, from New York University. And we, uh, we spoke with, with uh, Arjun about uh, the, the politics of finance and the, uh, the specific, a very specific innovative uh, framing of finance that Arjun has provided in his recent work, um, and specifically of the derivative products of finance, the, the derivative markets, uh, in, in, in finance. And so um, we, we spoke about specifically um, a logic that is at the heart of those, of those products, which is this specific relationship that they have with uncertainty. So rather than, uh, it, it's commonplace to think of financial markets as um, being uh, very risk averse or, or being um, not desiring uncertainty, responding negatively to to, to uncertainty, to political uncertainty, for instance. Um, but uh, actually quite, uh, it's, it's, uh, Arjun's work shows, uses the derivative as a product to show us that 
uh, it's rather the opposite, actually. Uh, the financial, very sophisticated, uh, technologically uh, uh, generated uh, uh, tools, financial tools, have a very different relationship with uncertainty. In fact, uh, they find they can find they rely on uncertainty to generate profits. Um, so there is. Uh, in, in his work, Arjun talked to us about how he sees that logic of the financial derivative and its capitalizing on uncertainty uh, being uh, trickled down to society writ large. And um, he actually used this very interesting, interesting, interesting term, the trickle down uncertainties, to talk about how uh, in our current sort of contemporary moment, one of the impacts of finance has been precisely that it has circulated largely, broadly, uh, those vast uncertainties from which it can profit, yet uh, most of us uh, are debilitated by. So we, we respond with anxiety to the same uncertainties that finance responds uh, uh, more lucratively and generates profits. So we had a very interesting discussion about those questions uh, from, from his recent book, Banking on Words. So as we wrap up the uh, launch event here, um, we thought maybe we would just ask one another a quick question that links our um, this this project to the wider research that RS and I respectively are doing. Um, RS, I, I wanted to pick up on something we we were just talking about in terms of uh, Esther Leslie's contribution um, and some of the contributions that we have coming up with with. Uh, future guests on our podcast uh, that dovetail with, I think, your interest in, in a book you're working on right now about the connection between uh, financialization um, and its effects on the imagination on the one hand and new digital technologies on the other. And I, I'm curious um, to, to think for you to kind of explain to us how, you, how you're thinking about how technologies that we wouldn't necessarily expect are expressions or articulations of financialization and anxiety. You've been looking at dating apps, uh, for instance, and, and astrology apps, I know. Um, and, and I think, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're trying to find in these not only the kind of grim neuro hacking of techno financial capitalism, you're also trying to find the seeds of a kind of counter speculation that uh, that people might be able to perform or that is being performed that that portends some more radical possibilities for transforming society can can you talk us through that a little bit yeah no thanks for this yeah i mean and i think it actually links well to the to arjuna padura's conception of derivative and how finance works and um, and i think it also this question about the role of technologies today is is very important and it's also very interesting because i think it shows us something about the more insidious logic of finance, the imagination of finance and how it affects us all. Because um, some of those technologies that you've been talking about, that we talked with some of our guests with, uh, are uh, on the one hand, very much expressions of, uh, it's, they are the new digital commodities. They are at the very heart of, um, uh, they embody finance's logic of accumulation uh, it, by, by the very, and, and especially relying on uh, this logic of uh, evaluating assets and it's all based on appearances and, you know, all these big companies, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. So on the one hand, these are financialized companies that have huge control power over our lives. But on the other hand, I do think that they also play an, a different role in circulating that financial imagination um, amongst their users and specifically the younger generation of users that are even more adept and, and uh, sort of embedded in those technologies. And I think that without, uh, without wanting to be, um, I, want, I, I sort of trade carefully because I don't want to, uh, to be an apologist or to suggest that they're, they're, these are truly radical tools that Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok are the new radical tools for revolution. But they do something quite interesting. And I think just to say just a few brief words on this, um, they do something about, uh, they, uh, they, they train the everyday ways of our thinking and imagining 
to deal with the uncertainty that we're faced with in very interesting ways. So rather than operating in a way that they offer us uh, sort of concrete solutions or concrete kind of gratifications, they sort of seem to embed us more and more deeply into this chaotic order of our day. So things like dating apps, um, for instance, that you mentioned, I, I'm quite interested in them in what sort of, uh, uh, what needs they respond to, what, um, uh, how they link to our uh, contemporary desires about um, uh, emotional and intimate and sexual fulfillment. Uh, uh, these desires that that don't that seem to be forever unfulfilled in a way there is this kind of um, on, on the one hand there, there there is this logic of uh, infinite options of partners that they offer us um, that on the other hand uh, they are also a way of uh, of connecting with that uh, with that world with that universe of of that is inherently uncertain so they communicate that uncertainty back to us. And, and it's a similar story with astrology apps that are fascinating and, and um, very, very rapidly becoming a huge success with younger generations at the moment. And again, they do something, they don't really offer any answers like, you know, people used to look to astrology for some sense of uh, security and, and a narrative. What they do, these apps, is they, they just, again, seem to recreate and represent the very conditions of uncertainty that we find ourselves in. So in a way, the way these and other technologies work, uh, I think, is very interesting because they seem to be mirroring the conditions of our very chaotic lives. And in doing so, I do think that they offer us a space to stay with that uncertainty. And, um, and, and maybe then it's, it, it's, it's interesting to see what, what is the, possi the political possibility of that. But that probably will take us on to another big discussion. Uh, but yeah, but I think this is a very interesting question, the role of technologies in that, in, in navigating our very radically uncertain times. Um, so, but, and perhaps if I could ask you a question, Max, uh, uh, that also links to, to some of your current work and the, the recent book that you, you just published on, on the politics of revenge. Um, so I know you, you've been thinking a lot about the uh, the types of uh, uh, re the types of sort of um, revengeful politics that we have been uh, witnessing over the last few years the the, the, the types of violent uh, and uh, angry articulation political articulations that we we see uh, under capitalist conditions and I was wondering how you see some of the more recent uh, political events, the more recent uprisings, the, the Black Lives, Lives Matters uh, protests, um, and the general kind of political responses we see in, in, in the wake of this huge pandemic crisis. How do you see those type of uh, movements and politics resonate with what you have discussed in your book as uh, a type of revenge politics? Yeah, thanks. Um... I mean, I guess I would start maybe with the with with that that term that Arjun Apodurai gave us in in our interview with him of, of trickle down uncertainty that somehow a world reconfigured to suit the desires and needs of finance of high finance is one that is beset by cascading crises constantly. Uh, and these crises are unevenly distributed around the world. They're unevenly distributed even within particular geographies by race, by class, by gender. Uh, we live just in a world of constant overlapping inter, um, interwoven crises. Um, and, but we also live in a world where the source of those crises in the kind of machinations of global capitalism as it inherits legacies of colonialism and imperialism, um, and the legacies of capitalist accumulation over the last centuries is that's all rendered opaque. So I think everyone in our society with perhaps the exception of the very rich and even among the very rich, I think everyone in our society feels that life has become unmanageable on some level that, that we live in a world to, to take the title of our podcast of unmanageable risks, 
Um, and this produces in all of us, regardless if we struggle with a clinically diagnosed form of anxiety or we just uh, are living in a stressed environment, um, it bestows upon all of us an incredible level of anxiety. That anxiety then um, can be interpreted in a whole variety of different ways. So I think most of the time we accept the kind of neoliberal interpretation of anxiety that uh, it's all our fault, that we, that we somehow screwed up, um, and that because we're not living a successful life, um, and we're not happy and we're so anxious all the time. It's because of our own inherent failures uh, And that narrative is one that's sort of pushed at us constantly uh, Even in spite of the incredible advances that mental health advocates have made over the last 20 years to destigmatize mental health um, I think though increasingly there uh, especially in the decade after the 2008 financial crisis when it was sort of revealed that the system is a bit of a sham um, and the, the decade of re relentless austerity. Um, there's a sense that many, many, many people are turning to structural and systemic explanations for why they feel so bad all the time and why nothing seems to be working. Some of those, I think it's great because we're now seeing that things that have been percolating in social movements, percolating in some aspects of academe, in terms of structural and systemic explanations for suffering, including capitalist exploitation, financialization, neoliberalism, racial capitalism, uh, neo-imperialism. These are actually becoming uh, things that lots of people are able to articulate and associate with their own experience. At the same time, I think we're also seeing the rise of highly reactionary, neo-nationalist, ethno-fundamentalist, um, and religious fundamentalist factions around the world who are also offering structural and systemic explanations for people's suffering. Uh, they're wrong um, and they're extremely dangerous, but they do offer a story where people can understand their experience um, of anxiety collectively. Um, and so, you know, you have uh, neo-nationalist, ethno-nationalist narratives that suggest that the reason why we all feel so badly isn't because we've been basically robbed for 500 years by the capitalist class, but because those outsiders over there are, uh, you know, robbing the government because of our generosity and largesse. Or you have religious fundamentalists who argue that the reason why everyone feels so anxious all the time is because uh, you know people have strayed too far from the literal word of God, and we need to uh, have a kind of massive personal and social social cleansing. Extremely dangerous moments, and I associate these reactionary um, tendencies with a kind of revenge politics, because unlike perhaps more liberatory visions, which would say we need a form of collective liberation, these uh, reactionary narratives typically are or organized around this idea that that someone or some group, some shadowy group of individuals, maybe a conspiracy, maybe so-called special interest groups, uh, have stolen what is rightfully quote unquote ours and we need to take a kind of revenge on them for, for stealing it. And so throughout my book and my recent work, I've been trying to catalog the rise of this kind of revenge politics is connected to a form of what I call revenge capitalism. And I also try and think through what it would mean to, in contrast to the kind of dangerous reactionary revenge fantasies that haunt the political scene today, what it would mean for us to think about what I call an avenging imaginary that could actually confront the real sources of our suffering and woes and take revenge on racial capitalism itself, take revenge on imperialism and colonialism, not in the sense of, you know, uh, getting rid of or killing the individuals who are responsible for it, although maybe that's part of it, uh, but actually abolishing those systems. And I think that spirit is what is, in some ways, I would suggest, is one of the things that's characterizing the uprisings of the last few weeks, where people are saying, we don't just want these individual police officers who murdered these people to go to jail, we want an abolition of the system of policing and prisons that empowers them to commit these murders and, and renders them uh, impugned from any sort of punishment or uh, restitution.
Right. Yeah, indeed. And, and I think, you know, these are, these are some of the themes to which we, we will return and we will be discussing with some of our guests in the episodes to come. I don't know, Max, if you wanted to say something about the, what comes next. Yes, we have some, a number of very interesting uh, guests who have been lined up and some of them we can't confirm yet, but one we can confirm is um, Nicholas Rose, whose work will be familiar to many uh, scholars among us for his incredibly lucid and helpful uh, theorizations of uh, Michel Foucault's notion of biopolitics and neoliberalism, uh, and author of a recent excellent uh, book that has been really useful for us, uh, Our Psychiatric Future where he really, I think, in a, in, a, in a very careful and systematic way, assesses the, the costs and benefits of the psychiatric and especially the biomedical and biopharmaceutical models of uh, treatment of mental illness. Uh, so that, that should be coming up in the next few weeks. It's very exciting. Great. Well, and on that note, I think we'll, uh, we should probably wrap up. And um, so thanks so much for joining us today for the launch of The Order of Unmanageable Risks, a podcast about anxiety and capitalism. We look forward to, uh, to uh, well, we, we hope that you will tune back in and listen to our coming podcasts. And um, if you want to find out more about those podcasts and more information about our guests and the series, you can follow the links in our uh, website, anxious.community. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.